Good morning, everyone, and happy Palm Sunday. This is Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. This is our third Sunday of having worship by conference call, and I'm recording the Bible reading and the sermon for anybody who wasn't able to make the call. Uh, we're reading today from the passage right after the one we did last week in John chapter 12. Um, where the sisters Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus um, hosted dinner for Jesus. And um, here we go, John 12, 1 through 19. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was being given in, Lazarus, in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at table with him. And Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who later was to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, for your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This ends our Bible reading for today. Now, throughout the season of Lent, I've been uh, using some uh, materials from a book called The Day I Met Jesus um, by uh, Frank Viola and Mary DeMuth. And uh, this is going to be a first sermon first-person sermon written from the perspective of Mary, Lazarus' sister. And uh, some of the language I've taken from the book and some is from me. Um, here we go. In the days after Jesus raised my brother Lazarus from the dead, my life got increasingly strange. People had started gathering in the area hoping for a glimpse of either Jesus or Lazarus for both of them were famous now. People came for a lot of reasons. Some were just thrill seekers, always following the latest buzz. A lot of them believed in Jesus, or at least thought they did, or, or maybe they wanted to. But it was also impossible because the Pharisees, their spies and agents were everywhere. They wanted to kill Jesus and you had no idea who was who. So Martha and I decided to try and lighten the mood by hosting a meal. As Jesus and his disciples came to the door, I remembered the first time we had met Jesus, how I had bowed at his feet, somewhat to the consternation of my sister, who was getting the food ready, and I, how I had welcomed the good news from his lips. And now we reprised our roles. 
Martha served with holy fervor, but this time with joy, not with fretting. I could not bring myself to join in the presentation of the figs and the olives and the fish and the wine, because somehow I knew something was wrong. I had this feeling of tightness in the pit of my stomach, certain that despite our celebration, something bad was going to happen to Jesus. You could figure it out if you listened closely to the way he talked. A thought formed in my mind, the conviction that this would be the last time I would see my dear Jesus alive. There was something in the way Jesus and Lazarus looked at one another. There was a look of knowing that passed between them. My brother had no words to tell, though I peppered him with questions about the hereafter and what it was like to have been called from death back to earth. But when those two looked at each other, I knew they held a secret, one that Lazarus could not tell and one that Jesus would not reveal. In that moment, I knew the specter of death haunted us all. A memory came to me of the spikenard flask of perfume my mother had given me. She had pressed it into my hands before her last breaths. For provision, she said. I walked over to it, opened it, and inhaled deeply. Such a medley of fragrance for such a tragically amazing man. I crossed the room sat at Jesus' feet, and began pouring out our livelihood in extravagant gulps. I watched the perfume flood over those worn feet. I took down my hair using my tresses to spread the essence of nard through his toes, the tops and bottoms of his feet up to his ankles. Then I poured the last portion on his head while the fragrance dripped down his beard, and then it teardropped onto his tunic. The room pulsed with the scent, and in that moment I knew I had anointed my king for burial. It just felt like the perfect thing to do. And then I heard Judas' voice, dripping with both shame and sarcasm. That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold, and the money given to the poor. The other disciples chimed in, agreeing with Judas. I wanted to retreat into the kitchen this time to hide myself there, to rid myself of Judas' very true statement. Perhaps I had been wasteful. Jesus put his hand on my arm briefly, a sign to stay where I was. Leave her alone, he said. She did this in preparation for my burial. And the men around the table gasped. Jesus nodded, and as he did, I could see the truth of his words. He would die. He knew, I knew it before he said it, but his words confirmed my grief. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. His words sombered us all, cast a pallor of death over our group. Jesus, the one who raised my brother Lazarus, he would die, and soon. The perfume which had scented the room with life now hinted at burial. He looked right at me, right through me, actually, and cleared his throat. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. The next day, Jesus and his disciples left and joined in the joyous parade. You have heard about it, I'm sure. Jesus was on the donkey. Everyone waved palm branches. Some people spread cloaks on the road. They all shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They looked excitedly at Jesus, and some also pointed at Lazarus. And this scripture from the prophet Zechariah was on everyone's mind. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. But I couldn't go. I stayed home with my sorrowful thoughts. I thought about Judas' words. There was one part of me that agreed with him. Helping the poor is important. 
Jesus himself taught us that. But it isn't the only thing. Your stance can't always be one of conserving, of waiting, preparing. My nard perfume might have sat in that jar for decades unused. There is a place and a time for extravagance, for pulling out all the stops and giving everything you've got. As I would reflect on those crazy days in the years to come, that is what stood out for me. Jesus himself was an extravagant gift from God. God could have found some other way of forgiving our sins. God didn't have to send or become his son in the vulnerable mortal form of Jesus. God didn't have to experience the pain of the cross. But God chose to do that for our sakes. Like I said, there is a time and a place for extravagance. For pulling out all the stops and giving everything you've got. This is precisely what God did for us in Jesus the Christ to show that extravagant love. May we realize that and process it and find that it shapes our lives and our character, that it draws us into this love which is, is much bigger and greater than anything we could have ourselves. And then may we turn that around reflect that love back out toward this hurting and troubled world. May God bless us all. Amen.